If you have a difficulty with another human being, there's some point of ignorance and some point of delusion that are keeping you from being able. On both sides. On both sides. The problem is you can only worry about yours. And then once you clear yours and your vision gets clean and purified and you approach a person from a purified space, things get a whole lot easier. Hey everyone, welcome back to On Purpose, the number one health podcast in the world. Thanks to each and every single one of you that come back every week to listen, learn, and grow. Now today is a very, very special episode of On Purpose. Not only is it the first episode of season three, not only am I sitting down with the one and only Will Smith, but today we're gonna dive in to the mind, the heart, and the soul of the man behind the movies and the music, and my dear, dear spiritual brother and friend. So, Will, with that, you know, without any further ado, I just want to say I am grateful, I'm humbled, I'm so happy to have spent so many special moments with you over the past year. This sounds romantic now. My wife's gonna oh, no. get worried again. <laughs> but uh, no, but no, I mean right. it, man. Been spending a lot of time with Will. Yeah, man. she's never felt she's never felt uncomfortable <laughs> about my relationship apart from me. <laughs> the only yeah, time no. she's doubted me is like, oh, another trip with Will. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> That's why this time she came along. We cer we certainly have some pictures, that, you know, <laughs> waterfalls, you know, <laughs> glaciers. Yeah, you know, <laughs> we we definitely didn't even take all the pictures. Uh, no, but, right. no, no, but uh, but no, thank you, man. This is. Uh, this is going to be special, and I'm just excited for us to serve together in this way. No, oh, this is this is fantastic. It's, it's uh, uh, been a long time coming for us to to sit down like this. Um, uh, for for the people listening, it's probably been a year. We're running up on a year now, right? Yeah. It's, it's like you know, ten months or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that uh, I've been studying with with Jay. Um, uh, I felt, fell in love with the, the Bhagavad Gita. Jay and I have been spending time. We've been hanging. We've been traveling together. Jay has really been the, the catalyst for this next phase of my life. We have uh, committed to one another in a brotherhood um, of service and support. And, uh, you know, we, we've been... Uh, I guess we've been in the gym. <laughs> you know, we, we've been the in, soul this, gym. In, the, in the soul gym uh, working out for the past eight months. And this is really, this is our first time, um, you know, uh, doing anything that's, a, a, that's public facing. So yeah. uh, I'm excited to talk about uh, what we've, you know, been working on. And uh, Jay's been working with my, my family pretty much uh, every day, a new Smith. Uh, <laughs> Starts to uh, study with with Jay Beautiful and um, also our our teacher Radhanath Swami. So it, it's been uh, it's been a beautiful year, um, and I'm very excited to to start talking to people about what we've been studying and learning and uh, doing together. Absolutely, man. And I also want to say too, like I think it's rare where you you get to sit down with someone that you've got to know intimately and closely. Mm -hmm. And also when you sit down, and I've I've probably watched, I'm trying to think, I think I've watched every interview you've ever done, like over the years. Before I met you, when yeah, I met yeah, you, yeah. And I'm always talking to you, I'm like, oh, I remember you said this five years ago or 10 mm. years ago you were saying this. And when I'm sitting down with you now, I'm thinking, you know, it's, I remember the first time I properly met you was at Willow's birthday a few years mm. back. And everyone was wearing, it was Willowween. Yeah. So everyone was dressed in costumes and stuff. So I didn't even know it was you. Mm. And then you had you had like the Zorro kind of mask over yeah. your eyes. And so it was a big person. I was like, oh, maybe that's Will, maybe that's not. I didn't know. And then you lifted your mask off. And the thing I recognized you about from the moment I met you was just your ability. You have this unique ability to just be really present mm -hmm. and kind and, and deeply there with everyone you meet. Well, well, and you, and I think Good. that for, you know, having having met you in public arenas, whether it was the Bad Boys premiere, and then in our personal meetings, as you were mentioning, you, you're just even better. 
Well, thank and, you, man. And, and I think that that's so hard to be yeah. when you're that good. <laughs> I so, so, but, yeah. but I remember that, and that was the hospitality me and Radhi felt with you, like that, that ability to care for each person walking in, the family aspect, making us feel welcomed and a part of it. That, I, I just think that that in today's world, that human aspect yeah. is what we're all missing. I think that's a, that um, is a, a part of my DNA. You know, um, part of it from difficult aspects of my childhood. You know, I, I grew up with violence in my home. You know, so um, I developed, you know, a really acute emotional sense, you know, out of defense. You know, I just needed to make sure that my father was okay. I needed to make sure things were going well. And I just became really hypersensitive um, to emotional movement in a room as a, as a defense mechanism. And then as I, you know, grew and as I started to uh, develop that, you know, that heightened sense that started out as defense, as I settled down and, you know, came into uh, a, a deeper understanding of my, my, uh, my power and my desires in the world, it was easier to connect to people in a loving way. It, it, trans, it transferred easily from a defense mechanism to an ability to love and, and care for people. That's, that's amazing though that you were able to process it positively. Yeah. I feel like we're living at a time, we've talked about this before, that our childhood experiences form our adult desires. Absolutely. And I feel like now people are starting to hear that in the conversation where they're like, oh yeah, because this happened with my parents. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now I feel like this. How do you think you were able to, because we've talked about this before when you've yeah. talked about different, your mother, your father, what you learned from them. Tell us a bit about what you learned and how you were able to process it positively and engage with it mm -hmm. rather than create a negative story from it. Because a lot of people may see violence and react differently. Yeah, yeah, I, I think there's always uh, an aspect of us that when we feel unloved, you know, in any capacity, in any relationship, when we feel unloved, uh, when we feel mistreated, when we feel uh, somehow disrespected, um, it's a natural reaction to want revenge. And I think that's what happens with most people, specifically in our, in our most vulnerable stages when we're children, and we have been, done anything to deserve that kind of treatment, um, it's really hard for the ego to not click into revenge, you know? And, you know, once I discovered that, that mechanism, once I saw that, that, like that, that most of us walk around with, yeah. that, you know, we, we want revenge against that mistreatment. It's a little piece of that with all of us. So the problem is that when you seek revenge, you destroy yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's the, um, th that's the paradoxical conflict that we all live in. Yeah. Someone has mistreated us. We want revenge, but if we take it, we hurt ourselves more. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, it's right? Designed. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, so that is the, uh, as Radhanath Swami referred to, the perplexing situation that we find ourselves in, and the 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 only answer is loving kindness, and most of us don't want to hear that. It's like. I'll take my chances with revenge. <laughs> I'm gonna take my chances with punching this dude in the face or cussing this girl out or whatever it takes, but uh, um, I can't do loving kindness. Yeah. And for me, I had such a beautiful example of loving kindness in my grandmother when, when I was growing up. I always knew I wanted to be that, the way that she loved and cared for people um, I didn't realize that her giving was connected to her peace. That was something that, that I got a, a concept of later. 
But I always knew that that was my example. And I think that's the critical part. We need, we need an example. Somebody has to be an example. Human beings are uh, creatures of example. We need, we, you got to see it. Yeah. You know, so uh, th that's really where I am in my life right now. I, I want to uh, show what it looks like to be loving and kind and giving and forgiving. Um, and and I, I just wanna, I wanna model those virtues as best I can. It's amazing how the thing we think that's gonna help us feel better yes. is actually what makes us feel worse. Yep. And you hold on to it because somewhere inside of you, you feel you have to be the person to show that person yes. <laughs> the truth. Like you feel like it's yes. your responsibility. Yes. You're gonna be the hammer of justice. Yeah, and so you <laughs> carry that. And it reminds me of there was this thing that this this lesson that we were talking about and sharing in, in our meetings was um, this quote by Russell Barkley where he said, uh, people who need the most love ask for it in the most unloving ways. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And that's what you were saying when you were yeah. giving examples of people in our society today who, it sounds crazy, but somehow they yeah. are seeking love. Absolutely. And when you, when you kind of put that in your head, you're like, oh, like that's, yes. that's just a plea, a, a begging. A begging, yeah. A literal like, it's not even a proposal, it's like a demand it's for a love. It's a demand, absolutely. And you were saying that, and, and I love what you said then, that's why I'm bringing it back to what I was saying earlier, the reason why I was highlighting the personal aspect of you is that I think that the example that you're setting through who you can be is even more than what you've done. Mm -hmm. yeah. What you've done is amazing and there's nothing to be taken away from it. It's phenomenal what you're achieving and what you continue to achieve. But being able to do that with a loving heart, yeah. that yeah. must be I mean, how does that feel internally? Does that also feel that way or, or no? Is that, are you like, no, no, Jay. No, the, the, success, the success feels way better than that, Jay. Yeah. You don't get it. But no, but you know, we, yeah. we, had, that, we had that conversation and that, there, was a, there was a real period in my life that I had to, to struggle with, we can win or I can be nice. Hmm. Pick one, <laughs> right? And different people, pick different things right. for the type of material world climbing, you know, that, that I did for a, a big chunk of my life. Um, it was military minded, you know, we're going to get that flag to the top of that hill and you are going to help or you're not going to be here. Right, so that's that's one mindset, and then after I got the flag to the hill a couple of times, and kept getting the flag to the hill, and realized that you just you don't feel good, and you've scorched earth, <laughs> you know, <laughs> around you, and you're like nobody nobody's really happy, you know, and then I started to have to question that mindset, you know, I had one of the greatest runs in Hollywood history, you know, that eight number one movies all over a hundred domestic, biggest global movie star, all of that, and my family was miserable, you know? And I had equated winning with happiness. Right? It's like, we're winning. What is y'all problem? You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And the, the transition from product focus, like military-minded, get to the top of that hill, and then I shifted into a, a mindset, and it was really my kids who brought me out of that, I, I shift into discovering, like, well, damn, people really care about how they feel, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, yeah, and yeah. As, as crazy as that sounds, no, like, you know, you know, my, my father wasn't concerned with how I felt, you know? He wasn't concerned with how he felt. He was military-minded. You achieved the mission. And there's two possibilities. When I give you a mission, there's two possibilities. One, 
you complete the mission, or two, you're dead. <laughs> Right, <laughs> you know, and that's what my father was saying. I grew up with that. Oh, cool, right? I actually had to discover feelings, right? And start like, I used to have to really focus on, okay, how's this person feel? How's this person feel? Not what do I need them to do? And not they're wasting our time right now and we're losing time and we're gonna not finish this mission, right? But there's a, there is a balance between the mindset of achieving and loving kindness that at this point in my life, I've actually discovered the magical balance, but it's really hard to get people to let go of the attack and defend achievement mindset and trust the care and concern for your fellow humans as a way of creating higher production. Yeah, yeah. I hope everyone who's listening and watching right now is taking this in because I think what you're painting is a very transparent, honest picture of our minds. Yeah, yeah. Like, I can relate to what you're saying. So I can relate to times in my life where I've been so about winning mm -hmm. and success and, and numbers or whatever it may have been. And, and I know I'm not even becoming the person that I want to be Absolutely. in that process and I don't even like myself. But because you're choosing to like yourself because of what you're achieving, yeah. you're finding a new way to like yourself, but not over who you really are. Yeah. And so I just hope everyone who's listening and watching, you know, when you speak sometimes, Will, it's so, it's so extreme because you've got so close to that emotion mm -hmm. that sometimes people can think, oh, no, that's a bit extreme. I'm a bit more balanced. Yeah. But really, we all have I that know. kind of, does that make sense? Like, yeah. we all have a bit of that extreme instinct inside of us in some area of our life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's, it's sometimes a delusion to feel, oh, I'm actually balanced. Like, yeah, yeah, we sometimes yeah, yeah. listen and go, oh, yeah, no, that's him. Oh, like, that's him. His father was military. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm balanced, you know? And we always feel, we always feel we're balanced. We're balanced, yes, like, exactly. We, I felt like I was balanced. <laughs> yeah. I felt like I was balanced. We always feel like we're on that, as the Buddha would say, as we talked about, the middle path. Like, yeah, we yeah. always feel we're on the middle path yeah. and everyone's lost. I know, yeah. And every, yeah. everyone yeah. else is confused. Exactly. Oh my gosh, that, that yeah. celebrity's confused or that person's on the wrong path. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. But, you know, I really hope as you're listening to this, everyone, that put yourself in those shoes, put yourself in that mindset. It's a healthy uh, activity to do. And you can um, learn something from the extremes also, right? Yeah. And when you, when you look at um, the athletes, right, there's a certain extreme mindset that you, I was going to say you have to take on. I don't know that you have to take it on. What I do know is that in this society, um, we worship that mindset mm -hmm. that, um, you know, it's the, 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 can you become... Michael Jordan mm -hmm. without that mindset. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that is a that is a really powerful, difficult question. It's like mo most people can't sustain the mindset. Yes. That, you know, fortunately, because <laughs> it's <laughs> it can be so destructive, yeah. but most people can't sustain mm -hmm. that level of discipline to manifest the things that they want in in their life and there's just a there's a poisonous edge to that kind of discipline and i've been to the edge of that kind of material world discipline in my mind and i can tell you you can have a whole lot of stuff and be miserable out there on that edge and i found a much more comfortable uh, and productive space in my life, and you still need that discipline. Yes, but it it it's like when you're when you use that kind of power to achieve things, it's like there's a uh, there's a there's a, 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 a brutal reckoning. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's a brutal reckoning yeah. at the at the end of that. But the amazing thing about you is you've been on that path in that direction. I think people sometimes see these flips where they're like. Oh yeah, now that you are rich and successful and famous, now you're going this way. But actually, from our conversations and how you've shared with the family or even when we've uh, worked with some of the friends in your life, it's like, this has actually been a long process. Absolutely. This isn't just 
10, 12 months. This isn't just a couple of years. This is planted a seed from your grandmother yes, absolutely. through your whole life to absolutely. always be reminded of it, to study spiritual paths, world religions, to study yeah. philosophies. I, like this is just a long process. Tell me about that belief your grandmother had in you mm -hmm. and tell me a bit about how she planted that deep seed because I think what you said at the beginning that we need that example, I think everyone, if they really reflected, there'd be someone in their life, either indirectly or directly, yeah. but sometimes we forget them. But when we've been talking to everything, your grandmother's been such a pivotal figure. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd love for you to share what you think she did that was so powerful because maybe there are some parents listening today and yeah. brothers and sisters and grandmothers and grandparents listening today and they'll be able to do that for their children and grandchildren. My father, my mother, and my grandmother, whenever I think about the, the three of them, um, I, I picture a triangle in my mind. And I see like my father was the, the base uh, as discipline. And my mother didn't care about anything but education. Like that you had to learn, grow, study, travel. Like my, you know, my mother was really serious about educating the mind. And uh, my, my grandmother uh, was love and God. My grandmother was that grandmother at Resurrection Baptist Church. And she had, you know, we were doing our Easter recitations and we was at the nativity, you know. <laughs> so she was that, she was that grandmother at the church and her life was deeply devoted to God um, and Jesus in the form of loving service, mm -hmm. right? So the form that it took was she was working hard to love everybody. You know, my, I remember my grandmother uh, bringing homeless people into our house when we were little and washing them in our bathtub. I thought that was the nastiest thing. I was like, ah! But she would be in the bathroom with her hands washing homeless people, you know? And as a child, it was like, no! <laughs> 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 you know? But as I grew older, I just, I just saw how dedicated and devoted she was to living her life in service. Um, it took me 50 years to figure, you know, <laughs> to figure out what the secret of that was, you know, but it, it's, it was, um, there was, there wasn't, there was a day of her life that wasn't devoted to uh, loving and, and serving. You know, and I just watched her. She worked the, the, the graveyard shift at the hospital, and she watched us, my brothers and sisters, during the day while my parents were at work, you know. And then when my parents got off work, then she went, she would take a little nap, and then she would go to work at the hospital, you know. And she was the, just the, the, the happiest person that I had ever met. Nothing faced her, she was okay. Um, and I remember I was about 12 and I had started uh, rapping. And, you know, so I had my rap books. So I had all of my, all my little curse words and everything <laughs> in my rap book. And she found my rap book and she, she never said anything. And she just opened the cover and she wrote uh, a letter to me. Um, Dear Willard, truly intelligent people do not have to use words like this to express themselves. Uh, God has given you the gift of words. Be sure to use those words to uplift people. And, I, you know, I was, <laughs> you know, I was sitting, I was reading that, and just love Gigi. Yeah. And, you know, that was part of the reason why I never used profanity in any of my music. Yeah. And it was like she, she missionized me in that way to make sure that what I was doing was uplifting others, you know? And when you're telling stories, yeah. you can always find the part of the story that is a gift for the potential upliftment of somebody that would see it, yeah, you know? So, uh, but yeah, she was all God, all love. <laughs> 
I love that, man. That's such yeah. a beautiful story. I hadn't heard yeah. that one before. Oh, we haven't talked about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we haven't talked about that one. When your grandmother <laughs> finds your yeah. rap book and you got curse words in it, it's a bad look. <laughs> it's a bad look. Well, it's, it's good that she found it that early and that, for, that had such an impact on you and, mm -hmm. and brought you out. Where was the, as you started to grow in that success and that journey, and you decided you wanted everything you do to have a positive impact on others, whether it was music and then movies. And then that journey led you to just tell us about the, the hard work and graft that went into the creation of what you said earlier, which was like, I was working so hard and my family hated me and this didn't work. But tell us about that hard work, because I think sometimes it's forgotten. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's almost like, you don't realize how, when I started spending closer time with you and started seeing you on set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in the trailer, and then you'd walk out, and in two seconds, you'd be in character. Yeah, yeah. And then you'd walk back in, and you'd be real again. <laughs> and, then, and then we were in your man cave, and you have, your, um, you have the movie plotted out, and you'd walk me through like how that tells you what. And, and I started to understand and appreciate that what you do is a science mm -hmm. and it is strategic and systematic and it is a skill you have worked on for decades and decades and decades. You start to realize that the external view of like, Will's charismatic and he's cool and you start to realize like, yes, but that is underpinned with yeah. just hard work. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that that's a real awakening that a lot of people don't get to experience mm -hmm when they see you on a big screen. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. you don't see all of that there. You don't see the, um, the learning of the lines and, yeah. and you have a phenomenal memory. Like you, you know, we're studying spiritual books together and you can remember stuff that you've read that day and that comes from all your years of training and, and even your ability when we first met and you said, Jay, I'm an actor, you know, when we direct, just direct me and we'll, we can do this because yeah. I can drop into a, <laughs> Drop student it. mindset. Absolutely. So, so much of this is internalized. It's not. Tell us a bit about how long it took to learn all of this and start playing with it beyond just thinking, "Oh yeah, I've got this because I, I can act." I, you know, I grew up in a military household, and um, you know, while there, you know, there are certain emotional drawbacks to that. Um, there, there are uh, intellectual and organizational pluses that are, um, you know, hard, hard to beat. So, um, you know, my, my father was really, you know, strict on order, um, organization, and the uh, incremental completion of tasks, you know. Um, and, you know, also combined with my mother's push on, on education uh, as a really young child. You know, we had to put hospital corners on our beds and our shoes were lined up, and, you know. So, and, you know, at, at six years old, you, we, were, we were forced to think along those military lines. Um, and everything was a mission to my father. Like, you know, never, there was nothing that was, um, a basic task. You weren't just gonna wash the dishes. <laughs> you know, it was a mission, you know, that had to be completed with, um, you know, military precision, you know, down to how much dishwashing liquid you're using and how much the bottle cost. And if you use that much and how many dishes do you wash with that amount of dishwashing liquid and how long are you gonna be able to use this dishwashing bottle so you can relate that to how much work you have to do to be able to wash that many? Your dad sounds Indian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I was like, so Will, is your dad Indian? Like, that's like, well, yeah. that's more, that is intense. Yeah, you know, so it was really, you know, his, his mind was like that and I took, you know, we always take the things we hate the most from our parents. But you know, from that, the, the gift of, of structure and the gift of breaking tasks down, you know, you set the, you know, you set the goal, but the breaking the tasks down into smaller manageable pieces was a thing that I came out of my childhood with. Um, 
you know, for for example, you met JL. Did yeah. You meet, yeah. So I told when I when I said I wanted to I wanted to be the biggest movie star in the world, you know, and I was. 18 or something. Oh, no, I haven't like met that. him yet. Yeah, I know you talking about. I haven't, yeah, I haven't met, met him yet. Yeah, yeah, I know you talking about. Yeah, and yeah. I said I wanted to be. I wanted, I wanted to be one of the biggest. I want to be the biggest movie star in the world. So the first thing that we did is we looked at. Okay, well, what are the top 10 movies of all time? Because if you want to be the biggest movie star in the world, you're going to have to make the biggest movies in the world. So we said, well, what are the top 10 movies? So we looked at the top 10 movies. We said, well, well, what are the patterns? What are the patterns in the top 10 movies? And at the time, 10 out of 10 were special effects movies. And nine out of 10 were special effects movies with creatures. <laughs> and eight out of 10 were special effects movies with creatures and a love story. <laughs> so you know, for that's where the bent for me towards sci-fi movies came from, the recognition of the patterns of sci-fi creatures and a love story. So that became what we were looking for with everything. And then Independence Day was a no-brainer. And then Men in Black was, uh, you know, <laughs> b behind that. Yeah. And it, it's it's that kind of... Uh, systemized algorithm. Uh, yes, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. Looking yeah. for what's the what is the pattern, you know, and that's that's uh, you know one of the one one of the gifts my father uh, uh, stuck me with coming coming out of childhood. Yeah, this is one of my favorite parts about talking to you because of this ability to to turn those into gifts. Yeah, yeah. and and I, I want to just emphasize that point to everyone who's listening and watching again because. I think we're living in a time right now where th there's a lot of bitterness towards parents yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and what we've received, and and some and rightly so as well. Like some things are, you know, quite hard to deal with that level of trauma, etc. But at the same time, when we start looking at our lives this way, not in a, not in a fake way or an ingenuine way, but but really start to process some of these things to see the powers that it gave us. Absolutely. All, all the superheroes that we all love in sci-fi movies, yeah. they all got their powers from bad things that yes, happened to exactly. them. Yes, like, exactly. No one ever had something good happen to them. And then they, like for Spider-Man, he got bit by a spider. By, uh, yeah, and for this never, person, yeah. like <laughs> got abandoned by his parents. Like all the superheroes we all love and worship yeah. all got their powers from something bad happening to them. You know, it's really difficult to say that to someone yeah. in the, in the middle of the the throes and of you a traumatic experience, we've talked, yeah, about, we've that. talked about that, right? But yeah. you know, from sitting on this side of the experiences that I've shared, I you know, in in my life and in my experience, um, there's 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 no such thing as a bad experience, right? There's experiences you don't like. And they hurt. And they hurt, right? But to define something as a bad experience for, for me um, has not been true. Everything that's ever happened to me in my life that at the time um, was deeply traumatic and and debilitating you know there's there's you know been only two times in my life when I contemplated suicide wow you know there's been two times in my life um you know and the 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 once was when my my uh, mother and father uh separated when my parents broke up and I you know I was 12 and you know that was one of the only you know serious times in my life that I, I contemplated suicide but even out of that as I look back on that the pain of that experience cultivated devotion in my life to my family and I just never wanted to have my children suffer that and of course, the you know the I uh, got divorced with, from Cherie, so that was I was recreating that situation. But it 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 woke me up in a way that forced me to try to uh, connect with my children. So 
the, the negative experiences or the things that were awful at the time, there, you know, there's, the, there's always the other side of the coin. And in my experience, I've cultivated uh, only positive things out of the most negative experiences uh, of my life. My, my, my father's death um, and the six weeks up to my father's death was probably the most formative time in my life. And as painful as it was and as difficult it was and all the stuff that came up during the time, I still, it, it was a powerful, formative, positive experience in my life. T tell us a bit about that, if you don't mind, about yeah. why you felt it was formative. And because I think a lot of people go through the loss of their parents. And, you know, we've talked about this, like the idea of like sometimes people regret of what they did or didn't say to yeah, their yeah, parent. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or maybe what they expected of their parent. What was it that was so powerful that allowed you to feel that way about that moment? Because um, I, I got a gift that some people don't get, and it was that the doctors told us he had six weeks to live, right? So, and then he lived for four months, mm -hmm. right? So, I, I got a warning. So most people, you know, most people don't get a warning. You just get the call one day and you just, you just didn't get a, a chance. Um, and when I found out that he was dying, um, it just, by the grace of God, was in the middle of the shooting. I was doing a movie called Collateral Beauty, and it was about a guy dealing with the death of his daughter. So I was into the uh, Tibetan book of living and dying and um, reading all the, uh, was it Elizabeth Kubler, uh, just reading all, of the, all this stuff about death. So I'd been programmed for six months, and I had read and studied all of this all these books about death and grief and dying, and then I get the message, and I was like, <sighs> I, you know, I sat down with my father, and I, of course, I had all of my traumas and all of my issues and everything with him, but I had also been I, six months of programming of all of the things that you're supposed to do, <laughs> you know, to prepare yourself for the death of a loved one, and. You know, so I, I sat with him and we we talked about everything. So I said everything that I wanted to say, and we we got to those six weeks. And when we got to those six weeks, uh, we were clear. But then he lived for another three months. So what happened was every meeting, every time I saw him, I was flying back to LA. But every every time I saw him. Um, was like, oh, thank God. Yeah. And then every time we said goodbye, we made sure we said a good, thorough, full goodbye because we knew at any moment that could, it could actually be the last goodbye, mm -hmm. right? And, but the lesson was, it's always like that. When we say goodbye, we can't know if this is the last time we will ever see. You should never greet someone casually or say goodbye to someone casually. And that lesson came from that experience. Every moment was so rich. Every time we saw each other, it was, ugh. and every time we said goodbye, we made sure it was a good, thorough, full goodbye. Th but that's how you're supposed to live every day anyway. <laughs> every time you leave your house could be the last time. You're supposed to like be in the richness of your hellos and goodbyes and thank yous, you know? And, you know, so I, I learned that lesson um, with my father. And then when he, when he passed, it was easy. We were, we were finished, you know? And just the lesson of that kind of presence and that kind of attention and that kind of recognition that tomorrow's not promised, you know, and just getting sh getting shaken out of thinking that you're going to have, you know, tomorrow. Anybody who hasn't spoken to their parents or their brother or their 
cousin that they had a thing with or their ex and they don't talk anymore, call them right now. You just don't like, don't think you're gonna have a chance to call them to, to, mar- to tomorrow or next week. And it's like that, that opportunity with my father changed every relationship in my life. I, I've cleaned all of the relationships in my life to no regret. I do not want someone to be gone and I wish I had and wish I could have. And all, I'm, I'm just, I'm not doing that in my life. That's beautiful, man. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's just, hearing you say that, I think there's a lot of people who needed to hear that. And I'm hoping everyone's gonna pick up the phone and yeah. message. And if that person's not here anymore, still write them a letter. Still, right, absolutely. Right? If they're not yeah. here anymore and you didn't get to say all of that, write a letter. Mm-hmm. Read it out to them. Yeah. Read it to a picture of them if that's what yes, it takes. Absolutely. Like, allow yourself to share yeah. and express. Yeah. Don't hold it in and hold it back because somehow that energy will still yeah. reach that person. and that energy's left you too. So, Absolutely. you know, even if you can't call someone up today, make yeah. sure you make sure you still follow the same practice because yeah, it's it's just not, it's never worth it. It's yeah. never worth it. It's just never worth it. Never worth it. And and I love that idea of valuing each hello and goodbye. Absolutely. And, and not taking it for granted or taking it lightly. You never know whatever's gonna happen, right? You just have no idea and Unfortunately, we, we, we see it. This is, this is the, um, there's actually a beautiful, I, I don't know if we ever talked about this, there's a beautiful piece in the Mahabharata, mm-hmm. which is the Gita is a small yeah. part of, and one of the students asked the teacher, he said, what's the most amazing thing in the world? Mm-hmm. Like, what's the most incredible thing in the world? And, and the teacher responds and says, the most incredible, amazing thing in the world is that we see people leave all around us but we never think it's gonna be us. I never. <laughs> like, so you see it and you have that know, moment yeah. again and again, and then you lose someone in your life and you think, oh, that could be me or yeah. that could be someone else. Yeah. And you live like that for a day. Yeah. And then the yeah. complacency sets back in. Absolutely. Tell us a bit about, you know, you've been studying world religions and spiritual paths yeah. for, for a long time. Absolutely. And the first time I officially reached out to you and your team and everyone, which was a few years back now, was because I saw that you'd been reading the Gita. Yeah. And the Gita was obviously the book that I read and studied so deeply and, and fell in love with. Mm-hmm. And after having studied world religions myself too, and, and I've, I've had beautiful experiences reading the Bible and the Quran and, and the Gita. And so when I saw you talking about it when you were in India, yeah. I was just like, wow, like, this is amazing. <laughs> like, I, I'm already a huge fan. I love Will Smith. Like, how is Will reading the Gita? I was like, how did that even happen? Yeah. And then when I got to know you and Jada and spoke to the family, I realized that you'd taken on a challenge to like, study a world religion every year and yeah. tell us about that and what you learned along the way. What were some of the traditions that stood out in your journey uh, that, that and, and what did you learn from them, whether it was the Kabbalah or even Scientology, all those, because you've shared so many beautiful lessons with me from what you've studied yeah. and I'd love to pass them on. So what, what was, uh, I guess probably in the, the first 10 years, of our marriage, that was uh, me and Jada's bonding, right? So every year we would pick a spiritual tradition and we would study it all all the way through. How did you even start doing that? Like, because when I I heard you did that, I think Jada told me first, and when I heard you did that, I was just like, I was was just, it, it just took me aback because I've almost, you don't come across that all the time. And I, I was lucky enough to study world religions. My, my father started encouraging me when I was about 14 to start reading spiritual books. And I, I dated a Muslim girl who asked me to read the Quran. That's how I read the Quran, which was a wonderful uh, experience in my life at 16. I read the Bible because we would celebrate Christmas and I'd feel guilty that we celebrated Christmas, but I didn't hadn't read the Bible. Oh, right. So I started yeah, going yeah. to church on Christmas and then reading about uh, Christ and the Bible and I just absolutely fell in love with the scripture. And then I was just reading so many different books. And finally I came back to the Gita, which was the book I was brought up with. But yeah, tell me about even why you and Jada decided to do that. So I don't even, I don't even know how it <laughs> developed as a thing. I know um, uh, when we got married, we were trying to decide, you know, what what church 
we were going to get married and were we going to get married in Baltimore or Philly and what did, what did, what did, who was going to be the the priest, priest you know what, what, and you know, so Gammy had a different religious background than Gigi, you know, you know. So we were trying to figure all of that kind of stuff out. And and Jada didn't want to do any of that. Jada wanted for she and I to go to a mountain, you know, and you know, pledge our love and devotion to one another to God without, you know, she felt like we we weren't going to um adhere to this specific religious tradition, we would just be picking it for our, her mother or my grandmother or something to try to figure that out. So um, I think the discussion about the, the religious background we would raise our children in is what came up uh, when, we were, when we first got married. Um, and she grew up in a thing called the Ethical Society in, in Baltimore, and they would honor the, the different religions. Um, and my background, I, I, I grew up, I went to a Baptist church. Um, I went to a Catholic school. And some, somewhere in that first decade of our marriage, we were like, oh, wouldn't it be hot if we could say that we had read cover to cover all of the major holy books. Um, and we we started with the, the Bible. And I just remember seeing her Bible was Mark, you know how I do my books yeah. now. You see how I, like all my books are highlighted all the way yeah. through. And you know, she completed the entire Bible, you know, seven months before me. Right. <laughs> so now it's on. <laughs> <laughs> right. So then when it came to time for the for the Quran, I was like, I was I wanted to win. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so we would take a year and we would study all of these traditions as a, you know, really as a way of the two of us you know, bonding spiritually and, and, you know, intellectually around the concepts and. You know, we went through Kabbalah um, and, uh, you know, Scientology. And re really what was happening is every time I would meet someone who was of a different tradition, I would allow that person to introduce me to what their uh, tradition was. Um, and then I did Ali. And so we circled back around to the Quran during, during that time. But we really just... We we love the the idea of of spirituality and the study of the love of God, um, and uh, we we don't necessarily believe in organized religion. We believe that the organizations kind of jump ahead of the spirituality. You know the the you know. The Church of Christ is very different than Christ, the, the, the steps that Christ actually walked, you know. So we started to notice uh, those kinds of differences, and we just we really just wanted to find um, the truth, yes. you know. What is the truth? And you see how my whole family dives in. The kids are doing it yeah, yeah, yeah. now, you know, with the with the the Gita, and it's yeah. and it's really. Uh, just, just trying to find our way, yeah. you know, in in this world. Yeah, and 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 I love that, and I was so fascinated by that myself because I saw that within myself, mm -hmm. and so when I saw it with you and the family, I was I was so drawn to that yeah. because, yeah, I think that a lot of what we're trying to figure out in today's world yeah. has been suffered for long enough yeah. in an internal way that when you're diving into these books of wisdom, there's just so much there to unearth yeah. because people have been through the same challenges for decades and decades and decades. The, the, the problems have already been solved. Yeah. <laughs> and lived. And lived, <laughs> lived long enough. and solved, yeah. you know. Yeah. And at the core of all of the, you know, the, the spiritual teachings that... I've ever studied at the at the the core of all of the ideas um, 
how you treat your neighbor is central, <laughs> right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Yet somehow people manage to twist, you know, in, in all the faiths and all backgrounds. Totally. People do unto others as you would have them do unto you is very clear. Mm -hmm. If you ask yourself that question, well, in this situation, how would I have them do unto me? And you did that, you'd never have a problem. Yeah. Because the answer is never going to be, I think they should curse me out and spit on me and whoop my ass because I was tripping. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you just you yeah. know i mean i guess somebody yeah, so, would, yeah would, maybe would no like, <laughs> no 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 i think you're right yeah, i yeah. think you're right if i were in this situation how would i want them to treat me yeah yeah right it's and, huge it's, yeah. the, it's the most simple yeah. yet, the, yet the most profound, <laughs> most profound. And yeah it's yeah, yeah. we'd we, our teachers in the ashram would always tell us and I've said this to you before, but they'd always tell us that these principles, you'll learn them on day one, mm -hmm. you'll think that you know them on day two, mm -hmm. but you spend your whole life trying to realize that. Yes. And, and that's yes. the challenge with us, that yep. we, we take what we learn on day one and what we know on day two to be like, I already know that. Yes, exactly. And then the, the teaching doesn't, what I love about what we've been doing is like, the teaching gets to like, reveal itself yes, yes, to yeah, you. It's yeah. like, it's always opening up. It's like a lotus flower. It's, yeah. it's always blooming. It's not like, oh, it's open now, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's like always opening up to you. And if you give it that time and patience, mm -hmm. then you can truly see it grow and bloom into something. But if you just, if you just try and force it open, it, it just, I mean, it, you know, if you forced a flower open, it would just break. <laughs> yes, and, and that's exactly. what happens. That, what, I say, what I say to you all the time is, you know, so to, to give people a, a sense of it, so we're, we were doing, you know, two to four hours a, a day, you know, you know, a few days a week for months. For months, yeah. For months, you know. And, uh, you know, I, we were spending as much time together as we were, would spend with our families or other things. So we, 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 We've logged some real hours yeah. in, this, in this last year. And the thing that was always amazing to me is that we could take eight hours, right? And we spend it and we get it and we study, we do all of that. And you leave my house and I pick up my phone. <laughs> How quickly somebody could snatch me. I was like, and, and, and it really is a serious moment to moment practice to remember to be nice to people. When you get sucked back into the foolishness so hard and so fast, and that was frustrating <laughs> to me for a while. Like, li like literally we would do eight hours. And, oh, <laughs> and I'm great, I'm great. And you wouldn't be off of, the sh off of the block yet, and I pick up my phone and there's a business call, and literally that fast, like literally in, in 45 seconds, my mind could get triggered back into that, that mindset. You know, I, I, I know now that that's just, it's every day. Yeah. It's, you don't, you know, you don't get to know it and yeah. be done. Yeah. Like it's a, it's a daily practice for the rest of your life to be able to deal with the foolishness of this world in a way that's uh, productive and kind. Yeah. Now everyone knows I'm terrible at what I do. Well, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, as soon as you have to do it, it's like, oh, wow, like, Jay, you didn't, you, you're really bad at this. It's like, oh, Jay, you should have left Will with a little more girth <laughs> yeah, than that. I know. Oh, no. You can't even last two seconds with that. That's terrible. But, well, you're, you're, work, you're, you're working with years of, of sediment, you know. All of us, <laughs> lifetimes, like the yeah. conditioning is so strong. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's almost like when we start to do the work, mm -hmm. 
you're walking into a garden full of weeds. Yeah, yeah. So all the flowers are covered. Mm -hmm. all, the, all the beauty of the garden is covered in yeah. weeds. Yeah. And so you're cutting down the weeds. But because you've been watering the weeds for so long, they keep growing they back. Keep growing, yeah. And so you keep cutting them down and they keep growing back. And yeah. it's, it's the example, the analogy of the mirror that's given um, in the Vedic tradition around how when you walk in and you try and clean a mirror that hasn't been cleaned for lifetimes, it's dusty. Yeah. And so when you start cleaning it, the dust comes up in your face and you're like, oh, oh like, I can't see, I can't, yeah. I can't see. And that's what we're all going through. Yeah. And we, when we start realizing what you just said, the day to day, it's like if, you, if, if all of us said we want to plant, I keep using gardening analogies, but it's only because it makes so much sense. I feel because we're so disconnected from nature, yeah. our mindset has become instant yeah. and our mindset has become now. Whereas when you watch nature, nature's never instant. Yeah. Like, I call that hunting versus farming. Right. Everybody okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Hunting versus farming, where, where people just, let, just let's, let's get it. <laughs> let's get it and eat, right? <laughs> That's a great, yeah. I love that. Yeah. I love that. You know, versus, no, we're going to, like, we're going to plant crop, the crops, grow gonna, the, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's the idea that if you, if me and you said we want to plant a tree, you'd have to come back to that tree every day Absolutely. to see how it was doing. Yeah. And it wouldn't be a tree for many, many years, but you'd have to come back every day, water it, sunlight, move it, replant the soil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what we're doing with ourselves. But for some reason, because we're so disconnected from nature now, mm -hmm. we think that, oh, if I just meditate today, yeah. then it's, you know, it's like saying, oh, I'll eat today and I don't have to eat tomorrow. Yeah, right. Like, oh, I showered last week. <laughs> I showered and, last yeah. week, I'm good, yeah. I'm good. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, you know, and I, again, it was your commitment. I remember when we were on that first phone call and I was like, you were like, oh yeah, I want to work on this. I was like, how much time do you have? Like, how, how much time do you have? And I, you know, you're Will Smith, so I'm thinking you don't have any time. And, and I don't know how serious you get yet. Yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware yet of how, how immersed and yeah. obsessed you get with stuff. I'm still learning about you. And then you're like, I've got two hours. And I was like, all right, two hours a week, two hours bi-weekly, two hours monthly. And you're like, no, two hours a day. Two hours a day. <laughs> and I was like, wow, he's real. I was like, he's serious. I was like, I was like wow, he's, he's for real. And then, you know, it was just, it was, and I'd go away and you re-inspired so much of my own study. And that's what I was telling to you over Christmas, which is when we kind of broke off as I went to London and, and you, you've been traveling. It's like I spend the whole of Christmas reading myself for four to eight hours a day, meditating again. That's beautiful. Because I felt I had to be more to give you more. That's beautiful. And, and I think that that was such a gift you gave me where mm. I fell back in love with what I fell in love with years That's ago. That's beautiful. Because of the work we were doing. Yeah. And because when you're answering someone's questions, you have to read deeper and think more and mm -hmm. reflect more. And so for me, I went away from those meetings going, Gosh, I, you know, I better start reading more. You know? <laughs> you, it was, but it, that's what's so beautiful about sharing something yeah, like that together. Yeah. It was great when uh, with the, the Radhanath Swami, when when uh, you, you told him that you were going to be working with me, and I just loved his response. He said, "Oh, that is so great." you're going to get to teach all of the things you need to learn. Yeah. <laughs> I remember. I was, I, was, I was just telling him, I was like, I, I, was, I was explaining to him how sincere you are. And I was like, you know, he's so serious and he's sincere. And yeah, that's when he came back with yeah. it. You know, that's when you know you've got a good teacher. I know, he knows right? how to like squash your ego yeah. and, and make you realize how small you are. Yeah. And, and it was beautiful because from that moment, that was my attitude when I was meeting you. I was like, I'm saying this for me, I'm saying this for, you know, and, yeah. and that allows you to be so much more, um, just allows you to get out of the way. Yeah. And let yeah. the wisdom do its work. Yeah, that's and so real. <laughs> this, the central um, problem that has been the focus of my life and everything that I've done has been centered on, um, having a successful love relationship, right? So I saw my parents when, when they were growing up and I hated that my parents' uh, marriage deteriorated. And, um, you know, as young as I can remember, five, six years old, I wanted to be married. I wanted to have a family. 
Um, I've never been the guy that, that you know, wanted to do threesomes and groupies. And I, like, I just, I've never been that guy. I always wanted to uh, commit. commit and have a single successful relationship. So the, the, the scientist in my mind and in my study of spiritual texts and things like that, I've always been looking for the secret to um, successful uh, love relationships. And then as I've grown, it's sort of expanded and I'm seeing the through line. Uh, oh, the same basic ideas are successful parenting and the same basic ideas are being a uh, successful follower or a successful leader or a successful student. And I started to see the central issues with all of human relating. And it's, it's the, the problems, or it's not even problems, the problem is really singular. And if you're talking about a husband and a wife, or you're talking about a, a parent and a child, or a Democrat and a Republican, or a, a you know a Saudi and an American, whatever, in all of the configurations of of human difficulty, at the at the center of it is almost exclusively a lack of understanding of the other person's perspective, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, it sounds simple and it, 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 it may oversimplify slightly, but the, the, the concept of ignorance, the concepts of ignorance and delusion are always the problem. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's, it's always the center, if you have a difficulty with another human being, there's some point of ignorance and some point of delusion that are keeping you from being able- On both sides. On both sides, <clears throat> right? And the, the problem is you can only worry about yours. You have to clear yours. And then once you clear yours and your vision gets uh, clean and purified, and you approach a person from a purified space, things get a whole lot easier, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, you're all, you're, you are always bringing poison to the party. Mm -hmm. And when you recognize that in any difficulty you're having with any human being, you brought poison to the party. <laughs> right? And if you can focus on locating and purifying the, the poison you brought, mm -hmm. it opens up entirely new avenues of connection and compromise and solutions that you can create with a person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that has really been the, the central focus of my life and being an actor has been spectacular in that way because my life is exploring my mind, mm -hmm. you know, and changing it, right? When I play a character who believes something that I don't believe, I have to learn how to feel something that's in opposition to my truth, yeah. which is a spectacular skill set to have to uproot beliefs. Yeah implant new ideas and have them blossom on camera at the right moment. Yeah. You know, it's been such a, a powerful um, inner process of development to explore acting in conjunction with spirituality and supreme absolute truth, you know, to explore that as my job. Yeah. Is fantastic. <laughs> Everyone should be trained as an actor. I know, right? When you first said that to me, when you first said that to me, I was like, I never thought of it. And obviously I'm not an actor, and so I wouldn't know that. But when you said that to me, I was like, wow, that's like how people should be taught how to be students. Right. Because the idea that 
you have the skill set, and it's mm -hmm. a skill mm -hmm. to put your beliefs aside yes. and go, I need to live by the beliefs that this character would die for. Absolutely, yes. And what would they be willing to die for? Yes. And then you're experimenting with it, and then yes. you can see whether you like it or not. Right, absolutely. And how it feels, whereas yep. most of us are so grounded in our own beliefs that we don't know how to take that hat off right. and put another one on. Absolutely. And that's where all of our issues come from, because that story of someone else. Yeah. Someone that you know that did that extremely well in, in probably the, the most difficult circumstances with Nelson Mandela. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, you've spoke, we've spoken about it many times, mm -hmm. you've spoken about it publicly many times. I just found this clip of you guys together oh, that I love. No, yeah. That I love, uh, <laughs> that I have to show you. It's, oh, it's a while ago, but it's, one yeah. of, it's, it's really, it's, I've watched this whole, I would watch, the, anyone who's watching, you have to go watch the whole thing. I'm only showing Will a short <laughs> clip, um, but, but it's this clip here. was saying to you, you know, I'm an actor. I make rap music. That's what I do. What, what can I do? And, you know, I sat with Mr. Mandela and was so inspired. You know, you want to immediately, you want to quit your job. You know, you want to go out in the streets, you know, <laughs> you want to fight. <laughs> you know, and he, he said, wow. he said, no, you have to understand the power of what it is that you do. You have to understand the hope that is created by the work that you create. And he told me that don't not to force it, that the call would speak to me. And um, today the uh, the call has, has spoken to me and I humbly, gratefully, and will aggressively respond. And I thank you. Wow. You'll have to tell me what he said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. well I'll sit yeah, yeah, down yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. Yeah, this, it gets better. It gets better. Wow. Goodness. I had forgotten about that. <laughs> The willow. <laughs> that was <laughs> <the Jayden. laughs> <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. Wow. I mean, there are so many I could show you. That was oh one I picked. Oh my goodness. There were so many. That's like, fantastic. Beautiful clips of you two together. Yeah. No, that was, uh, that was, um, that was one of the, you know, I'm not, I'm not a man prone to regrets, you know, and uh, we talked about this a lot, but that was one of the, that was one of the regrets. And, and you know, I'm, I'm making my way back around to the ideas and that's, you know, part of our um, relationship uh, and with Radhanath Swami. Um, but I was sitting with Mr. Mandela. It may, it may have even been that day. And we were sitting, it was calm. He just had this look on his face. And I said, uh, I said, What's that look on your face? And he was kind of looking, he was just watching people. I said, you know something that the rest of us don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he definitely did. Yeah. Definitely. And he looked at me and he, it, the look that I recognize now was, he said, oh, right? That it was like, that's the right question, mm. you know? And he said, um, he said, if you come spend some time with me, I'll teach you. And somehow I was so, I uh, just felt so unworthy of that. He reached out to me every year before he died. And, you know, he said, I'm an old man. You need to come spend some time with me. And I just felt unworthy, you know, um, and 
he wanted to teach me what we're studying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, he went, you know, I, I, I've, I've tasted a little bit of what he wanted to teach me. And the, the, the question is, how can you smile in this world? Mm. You know, because you're not going to change it. You know, you're gonna you're gonna do your part, but th this 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 world is chaotic and it's brutal and it can be really unloving. Mm -hmm. And how do you do your part with a smile on your face? Yeah. You know, yeah. and it was um, it was really beautiful. One of the few things, not not even you know, I know things happened in their in their time, so it's not a not a regret regret regret. <laughs> But it's like a regret. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I always say to you that it's first of all, it's 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 actually a very um, the fact that you didn't go because you felt unworthy mm -hmm. is is a at least from the traditions I've studied would be considered ex extremely good spiritual qualification mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for learning. Yeah, <laughs> like like when when we think. It's weird, like spiritual life is like, it's teaching you self-worth without having low self-esteem. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, yeah. it's, and you said it once in an interview, speaking about Nelson Mandela, you said like, you know, it's like being in his presence made you realize how small you were. Yes, yeah. But how big you could be. How big, yes. Right, you said that. Absolutely. And when I heard Damn, you say, I said that? Yeah, you I'm said. I'm gonna start saying that again. Yeah. <laughs> That's good stuff. Yeah, you said that, you said that. And, and it was, when I heard you say that, I was like, that is spiritual self-worth. Mm -hmm. Like we live in a world today where self-worth or self-belief is all like, I'm the best, like I, I own yeah. this, like I'm worthy of everything. Like of mm. course Nelson Mandela wants to spend time with yeah. Andrew Smith. <laughs> like that would, that's material self-worth. Yeah. But it's it's fickle and it's boring and yeah. it's so, it has no base to it, it's baseless. Yeah. It, whereas that feeling of like, when, as you said, that when I'm with him or when I was around him, I realized how small I was, but how big I could be. Yeah, yeah. That's spiritual self-worth. Yeah. And I think people often can confuse humility with weakness yeah, or yeah, with yeah, yeah. Uh, low self-esteem. Like, oh, well, you must have had low self-esteem. Right. But it's not. It's just the idea that I still have to evolve a little bit yeah. to feel like, and, and you know. To deserve his time and attention. Yeah, and because no. you had that, I feel, you know, you've continued in your way to find the, and, and he's still involved in your life. I yeah. think that's the beauty of it. Absolutely. If someone loves you that much, yeah. they don't stop, like your grandmother, yeah. she didn't stop being involved in your life. Absolutely. And, and I felt every time you've spoken about him that you brought him into my life mm -hmm. just by speaking about him uh, and, and now into everyone else's life even more. And, and, you know, I'm sure, you know, obviously I can't speak on his behalf at all, but mm -hmm. all I can say is that his energy is still in your life Yeah, for sure. that's real. He lives through That you. is real. Yeah. It's, uh, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But uh, I want to talk about a few more things before I let you go. Mm -hmm. There's, I could talk to you forever, so, and we do do that, <laughs> so I won't do that today. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about when you mentioned, because this, I, have, I came back to this because this was the initial statement that was like, I need to get to know Will. Mm -hmm. And it was when you said that you were channeling your inner Arjun. Yeah, yeah. And, and you said that, and I was just like, what? I was like, what? <laughs> it just, two of my worlds collided. Yeah, yeah. I grew up watching Fresh Prince every day. Mm -hmm. I knew every pickup line. I, I used every pickup line because of you. Uh, I, bought the, I bought the bad boy suit. Yeah. Like, you know, for me, it's like, that was my teenage years. Yeah, that's genius. Uh, I, I, I watched Bad Boys for Life for the seventh time on the way here today yeah, yeah. to Dubai. Because I thought I wasn't, I, sh I was like, it's it's offensive to watch any other movie. So I've I've been a big fan for years. Then I go off be a monk. I come back, and then I'm in the world, and then I see you say this, and I'm like, what? Like to me, yeah. it was just it was so it was it's just and obviously getting to know you yeah. after that yeah. has made me go, okay, God had a plan, and this yeah. is all you know. But but tell me about why Arjun as a character for you has been because you even. And I think this is because of you and your storytelling. You even brought Arjun in my life, more to life. To mm -hmm. So tell me a bit about why yeah. Arjun was so synonymous with you. And You know, so the, there are um, figures in, in spiritual texts and uh, just in general for human beings, you know, being creatures of example, 
And there's, you know, for probably for five or six years before uh, Arjun, I, I, I just was stuck on Abraham. I just loved Abraham's life. Right, and I was following Abraham, and on his, you know, on his deathbed, he gets up to wash the feet of the guests mm -hmm. in his house. You know, just stories like that, you know, um, just really stuck with me. So then I started reading um, about Arjun, and the circumstance that he was in, um, for people that don't know, um, uh, Arjun is in uh, a, uh, a battle. His, his family has tripped out. He's, a, he's a, a wonderful archer. He's the best archer in the world. And his family trips out and take the kingdom. And they're like, you know, they snatch his wife and they're trying to disrobe his wife. And he's looking like, yo, what are y'all jokers doing? <laughs> like... And he comes home and he's like, and they seize the kingdom and he can't believe that they have done this. And he, you know, he's a warrior and, you know, he could get, he could get the kingdom back, you know, but these are his uncles and his, his brothers-in-laws and his teachers and people that he loved and trusted and they took his kingdom. And... They prepared an army and they're gonna fight Arjuna and he's, he's devastated that his family and his friends and all of that for material gain would, would do this to him and he's deeply pious. And they prepare an army, the greatest army that's ever been assembled, except that they don't know that God is driving Arjuna's chariot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? right? And they think they're going to tear through Arjuna, they're going to do all of this, but God is driving Arjuna's chariot, right? And even in that, you know, Arjuna, he's, he's, he's like, how can me killing all of my family be the right answer, right? And on the, on the other side of that, he's like, well, I'll just let them kill me. I'm not doing that. There's no version of me going into battle with them. I don't care how wrong they are. I don't care. And, it's, and as I just got deeper and deeper into that story, it's like, I feel like that all the time. Right? I feel like I'm in uh, what Radhanath Swami referred to as a perplexing situation. Always. <laughs> Always, right? <laughs> that I feel stuck in a perplexing situation with people I love where there's not clean answers, right? And I always feel strong enough like if if you if you want to fight, we can fight. I know I know how to fight, but I thought, how can that be the right thing? Yeah. You know, and I just really related to um, how the Gita handles those kinds of perplexing situations mm -hmm. and recognizing that's what life is you are born into a perpetual perplexing situation yeah. and that the the it was it was the first time that I'd ever heard the spiritual idea like that that life is a perplexing situation and you're never going to get around being stuck in the duality you have to elevate above the the whole thing yeah. you know and the, the 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 christian concept about that that i i always heard and never understood fully my grandmother would say all the time you got to let go and let god <laughs> yeah right yeah and it was and it was like that it just 
you know, the, the, the Gita filled in that concept of what it really means. It doesn't mean don't do anything. Yeah, yeah. Let go and let God doesn't mean don't do anything. Yeah. It means do your divine duty, mm -hmm. whatever that may be. And just for whatever reason, the study of the Gita at this particular point in my, my life really clarified a lot of ideas of how to move through a, a world where you almost can't do it right, yeah. <laughs> right? And yeah. it's like, there's a, there's God's playing a practical joke, <laughs> right? And when you start seeing, you know, that there's a trick in there, yeah. you know, and the, the, the Gita illuminated that trick for me in a way, I was like, how could I be the biggest movie star in the world, be the best at all of this, and you, how you not love me, <laughs> <laughs> right? And you know, how was my family miserable? And it's like, that's the trick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, you know, that's yeah. the practical joke. That's beautifully yeah. explained. Because it's, it's the perception mm -hmm. of the right reaction. Yes. That's where we get lost, is yep. that for us, something, what, Going back to what you said at the beginning, you were like, there's no such thing as a bad experience. It's, right. We're looking at the result yes. of our activities absolutely. as a signal of how well we're living. Yes, absolutely. And that messes us up yep. because the result of your activities is not under your control. Yes, absolutely. And so if you're living your life based on the result of your activities being a signal that you're successful, right. You're setting yourself up to, Absolutely. and all of us do it all the time. I was using um, Jada's reaction to my actions as a measure of the quality of my actions. Yeah. And one thing has nothing to do to with the, the other. other. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And that's, that's not what we're taught, right? And... You know, the, 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 the concept that someone's reaction to your behavior is theirs and your behavior is yours. And when you try to marry the two, when you try to use the outcome as a measure of the quality of your own being, yeah. that is the kiss of death. Correct. The, this, the way that this material world works, you can do everything right <laughs> and it still go wrong in terms of outcome. Yeah. And you can do everything wrong and it still goes right, right. in the outcome. In the outcome. The outcome is not connected to the quality of your behavior. And that is such a hard idea to, you know, to digest. So when I started interacting with Jada and with my family as uh, what a friend of mine, Michaela, Michaela Bohm. Love Michaela. Yeah, what she refers to as a freestanding man, right? So I am, I am certain and I am committed to being who I am and how I wanna be without a craving for someone's approval, right? Because I know their approval doesn't have anything to do with me, right? Yeah. And, you know, sometimes we get stuck in these situations where we're seeking the approval of someone for ourself Esteem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Self-esteem yeah. is about yourself, <laughs> right? Absolutely. But we start looking to other people for our self-esteem. And, you know, sometimes we find ourselves looking in broken mirrors to get a reflection of ourselves, right? And the greatest tragedy 
is when you look into a broken mirror to see if you're pretty, right? And you're gonna let that person tell you about your inner qualities. And the, the greatest tragedy is when you look in a broken mirror and you're gonna change your face to try to look good in a in broken book. mirror. Man, whoo, I'm so glad to be free from that. <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic. Yeah. That was, yeah, that is incredible. And, that, mm. and that's it, that's, mm. that's, that's literally it. Yeah. Like when you can free yourself from that cycle. Yeah, And, and, it's, yeah. and it's a trap. It's, it's rough. It's crazy, it's, it just keeps you there and, um, you know, it's, but, but that's what I think I keep seeing in your journey, like to see you at this stage in your career to still be growing, still be pushing. I mean, for people who don't know, like I, I have to share this because it's what I find, and this is the only time I get to tell everyone, <laughs> is, uh, you know, like for me to see you on set, busy, like, you know, I mean, for anyone who's never been on set, it can be a stressful environment. Um, you're, it's high pressure, like you're acting, you gotta know your lines, you gotta interact. And The sun's and going down. The sun's <laughs> going down. <laughs> Will would literally come back in the trailer and he'd be reading in between being on set. So reading spiritual texts, spiritual books mm -hmm. in between. And I, w I just saw that and I was like, wow, like, you know, it takes so much uh, effort and determination and hunger. Yeah to be filling each and every gap with growth. Yeah. And so for anyone who's listening to this podcast while they're driving to work, while they're commuting, while they're editing a video, however you're consuming this podcast, I want you to know like you're doing that same thing. You're committing to growth. Committing to growth. In your gaps when you could just be doing something else. Like you yeah. could have been in your trailer I don't know, doing what people do in their trailers. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what people do in their trailers. No, that's my past, Jay. Oh, yeah. I don't, don't do that in my trailer no more. Yeah. I'm in there by myself now. Yeah. All with me. And, and, you know, and we would, you know, and just I would see that dedication. And I think mm -hmm. if, you know, to find time in between when you're filming a movie and it's, you know, big budgets and all this, everything, and your, your, your focus was here. Yeah, yeah. Your focus was here. Yeah. Even in amongst all of that, that was truly inspirational. And uh, you know, that that behind the scenes look at your your internal journey is has had such a big impact on my life. Right. It's it's a no right. excuses journey. Yeah. It's the only thing to do, yeah. right? So, and that's to learn, mm -hmm. right? To we have to free ourselves from the the darkness of our own ignorance. Mm -hmm. And the you wouldn't call some a, something a problem if you understood it. The problem is you don't understand it, yeah. <laughs> right? That's why you're calling it a problem, yeah. right? You don't you don't call things problems that you have complete comprehension of. Mm -hmm. Right? So the 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 process of freeing yourself from the pain and the, the misery of, of your difficulties and your problems is in, you know, constantly cultivating a broader comprehension of the deeper absolute truth of what's actually happening, mm -hmm. right? And one of the things that I learned is that if I feel bad, um, if I'm unhappy, if I'm upset, if I'm disrupted or disturbed, the only thing that could do that is my ignorance. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that creates m misery is you, you, you slip into a sort of hopelessness mm -hmm. of not being able to figure it out. You know, and I just, for, you know, for me, it's I've grown, gotten to the to the place that life is school, right? You know, you're not getting the promotion you want at work. That's school. Get it, figure it out. Yeah. You know, someone in your family is sick. That's school. That's like 
life is the greatest teacher there is. You just have to be willing to learn and recognizing that your pain and your suffering is the thing that the universe is poking at so you recognize that's where you're ignorant. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, you wouldn't be having those sh struggles in those areas if you had a deep, um, broad comprehension of the fundamental realities of those situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, so beautifully said. Again, it's, I, well, as I was listening to you, I was thinking about how we're programmed to believe that life is for enjoyment. Right. But actually it's for education. It's for education, yes, and, absolutely. And we keep seeking enjoyment in yes. the education. Yes. So we're trying, yep. we think we're in a candy shop, yep. but we're in a classroom. I call that the poisoned honey scenario, right? right? You're, yeah. you're seeking enjoyment. You want something sweet and you don't recognize that that honey's poisoned, right? It's gonna be sweet going down, but it's, you know, the, the kickback on that thing is something terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we see that, we see that in, you know, what you're creating now. And I remember we talked about how you were amazing as the genie and you were saying how you felt you got to be mm -hmm. so much of you and yep. in the character, but even with the release of Amend that just came out, like, I, I feel like, We've talked about this concept before and you brought it up. You were like, you know, the sacred clown yeah, has yeah, always yeah, yeah. been the emblem and the symbol. Yeah. And, and again, it's, a, it's God's gift where you get to entertain, make people laugh, but yeah. you want to help people grow through that. Absolutely. And, and that's really hard to do, but you do. Yeah. that's you. That's who you are. And tell us about how that's now coming through in the work you're doing, like how you've actually brought this into reality because sometimes it can feel very heady. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But you've really been working hard on taking it out of the head, into the heart and into the world. Yeah, yeah, and that was, a, that was one of the things about um, uh, Aladdin, Aladdin that was so defining for me, you know, and that, that concept of the sacred clown, I had written that down in one of my books, you know, five or six, years ago, and it's like, um, at, at my core, that's it's either who I am or who I want to be, but it's in there, it's, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's in there really deep, and in playing the genie, it was like, oh, that, I was at home, right? That combination of fun, light, silliness, and the imparting wisdom to, to Aladdin, right? I was like, that, that's who I wanna be in the world. I wanna be singing and dancing and being silly and playing and all of that, and then sneaking the ideas <laughs> in, you know, under the joy. Um, but I had, I had uh, heard that, I think it was the, the, the Lakota, Indians or something yes, like that, yeah, the that Native Americans. Right. Yeah, 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 they yeah. they had the the image of the 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 sacred clown, which is often considered negative. Yeah, like some, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's like I I I connected to it. It's like oh, that's right. That's what that's what the singing and dancing and all of the joy and all of the smiling and all of that is for. It's a it's a just a beautiful conduit for the the ideas. And, um, you know, that's just, that, that's just at my core, that's, I'm, I'm happiest in that space. Yeah, beautiful. Well, I could talk to you for hours and we will. Oh, I'm sure we but will. But I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna <laughs> ask you what I call the final five. These are yeah. one word answers. One word one answers. One word to okay. one sentence, the fast five. Well, okay, fast uh, five. Will Smith, these are your fast five. The first is, what is the best advice you've ever received? The best? advice I've ever received. Um, the first day I got on uh, the tour bus when we were leaving for the first time, leaving Philly, me and Jeff and all our squad. And the, the last thing my grandmother said as the door was closing, she said, uh, she called me lover boy. She, she said, uh, she said, 
Hey, lover boy, remember, be nice to everybody you pass on your way up because you just might have to pass them again on your way down. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, and I, that, that always yeah. stuck with me. I love that. That's great. All right, second question. What's the worst advice you ever received? The worst advice? <laughs> <laughs> My boy Charlie Mack. <laughs> Charlie Mack told me, he said, hey, man, listen, listen, listen. The way you make a woman love you, to make a woman love you, you, you take out the dinner, you know, and then as you're going out to place, you just knock somebody out. Because a woman got to know you could defend her. You just knock somebody out. And if you knock, if you knock, I mean, it could be a stranger, but you just, you just knock somebody out and she see your strength. And that's how she'll feel confident. And it, it changes everything. It changes your sexual life. It just changed everything about it. But you, you got to get them good and just knock somebody out. <laughs> Did you try it? No. Yeah, no, I never, never, yeah. never tried. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. I love that. Oh, man. If you if you would have tried it, I yes, could, yeah. Yeah, no, I never tried that. Well, I kind of I kind of felt that that was bad advice in yeah. the moment. Third question. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to ask you about all three. Uh, no, two of them. Uh, one thing you learned, learned from observing the life of Julius Irving and uh, Muhammad Ali. Oh, wow. Yeah. So... Yeah. Um, so Julia Serving was like the man went right right in the heart of my childhood. The 76ers won the the championship in 1983 in a, a four-game sweep of the Lakers. It was heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, Dr. J was in everything in Philly. Um and I would say the, the, the single thing with Doc is he was, he was always dignified. No matter what somebody said, no matter what somebody did, he got in one fight in his entire NBA wow. career. But the idea that he was just perfectly still and uh, he was an exquisite well-spoken gentleman. Mm. And, and, and that was the thing. Uh, he was a killer on the court. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, you know, he was, he, was, he was just exquisitely elegant and peaceful mm. while at the same time doing the thing. And that balance of those two things I always thought was spectacular. I love that. That's beautiful. Man. Yeah. Oh, I, you said yeah, Ali. Yeah, yeah. Um, you guys spent so much time. Yeah, There's yeah. some great interviews between oh, you yeah, two. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Ali. Ali was hilarious. One of the things, um, you know, so Ali would just come to set. He would walk around. He would walk away and just get on a bus. <laughs> we say, "Yo, where's the champ?" And he would get on a bus and just ride a city bus and just ride with people. No idea where the bus is going, nothing, no security, anything like that, right? And he was engaged with, you know, people in a way I'd never seen anybody. Wow. Like, as famous as he was, he, he engaged with people in that way. And I would say the total and utter submission to God. Mm. Right, and he would he 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 looked like he was arrogant, mm. but he, it was it was the yeah. other way. It was like he was talking like that and acting like that because he was so utterly submissive mm. to the the will of God, mm. and that that combination. Uh, it just really inspired me with how I wanted to be with people mm. in the world. And I asked him, I was like, Chan, why do you, you just walk away with people like that? And, you know, you know, he said, oh, man, you got to let these people see you. He said, they, they ain't never seen nothing like you before. <laughs> you, got to, you got to get out there and you got to touch them so they know you real. People can't aspire to stuff that they don't think is real. You know, <laughs> you know, and it was like he was just so in tune with mm. what he was, you know, and he, he, he that the 
the seemingly arrogant humility was, was a beautiful combination. I love that. All right, question number four. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the biggest lesson you've learned in the last 12 months? In the last 12 months, I would say the, the, it's that um, ignorance and evil um, are twins. Mm. They look, you, look, uh, you look at them and they look, they look just <laughs> alike, mm. um, except that ignorance can be educated and evil is a much more mm -hmm. difficult problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say I learned, uh, fortunately, that ignorance is much more prevalent than blatant evil. Mm -hmm. If that, if that great, makes sense. That's a great yeah. answer, yeah. yeah. That makes a lot, I mean, that makes so much sense. We have to have a whole, Cool. I know, yeah. <laughs> so, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. All right. Fifth and final question. Mm -hmm. If you could create one law in the world that everyone had to follow, what would it be? One law that everyone had to follow. Um, it would be that you have to repeat back what you heard the other person say before you're allowed to say what you think. That the, the law is you're not allowed to respond to what someone said until you repeat back what you heard and the person has multiple opportunities. No, 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 that's not, I didn't, that's not what I meant. And until you repeat back accurately what the person said, you don't get to talk. That is a great law. <laughs> I love that principle. It helps in every area every, of life. Yeah, because yeah. we, our minds go way off the deep end with what we heard totally. somebody say, and our response. Well, first of all, we're not really listening because mm -hmm. we want to. We already know what we want to say, no matter what they say, mm -hmm. and and we go really way off the deep end. I, I, I was shocked and surprised by how far. Mm -hmm. we can be from what someone actually said to what we heard. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. It's that broken mirror. Again. That broken mirror, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah I love that. Yeah. Will, is there anything I haven't let you share, something in your heart right now that you're like, I have to say this, and you want to share um, it? But it doesn't have to be, but... Uh, no, not really. Just, uh, and, and that idea, there was a, something that yeah. popped in while yeah. you were saying it. Um, that's called the broken calculator, mm. right? So, and it's about, you know, human interacting and that the, the, the ego can sometimes be a broken calculator in that, imagine the seven is stuck down. So every equation you punch in is seven equals seven oh. equals seven equals seven equals seven. Right. So no matter what you say to a person, if they've experienced a trauma yeah. and in their trauma, you know, um, men ain't shit, men ain't shit. So that's the broken seven. Mm -hmm. So no matter what you say, no matter how you behave, it keeps coming up. Men ain't shit. Mm -hmm. And g getting our seven unstuck is a really critical part of being able to interact with other human beings because yeah. we're 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 painting uh on everything we hear them say we're adding our stuck seven, seven yeah. to everything they say and you just can't get the the equation to come out correctly if your calculator's broken I love that analogy. Yeah. That's awesome. I never yeah. heard that yeah. before. I love that. Yeah. If everyone who goes away mm -hmm. listening to this interview, the one thing you remember is that. Yeah. What, what is that broken calculator? What's yeah, that, that number? Broken calculator. You keep what adding you, to the equation. And you're going to make it be that no matter what is in front of you, your equation's coming up with your broken number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you want even more videos just like this one, make sure you subscribe and click on the boxes over here. I'm also excited to let you know that you can now get my book, Think Like a Monk, from thinklikeamonkbook.com. Check below in the description to make sure you order today.